Today we're starting a new semester, new season, and uh, I want you to switch gear. If you're a student, if this is a new semester or new school, if you will, you're done with uh, middle school, you're moving on to high school, okay? It's kind of interesting because I didn't really plan it that way. The first week of July of 2018, we started study of Romans. That's exactly a year ago from today. It was July 2nd, July 2nd, okay? And we completed a book uh, last week, June 30th. Uh, I didn't plan it like that, but Lord uh, just made to worked out like that. So this first week of uh, 2019, we're starting a new book. Okay, so if you didn't do well last semester, it's all right. Okay, you you know it's okay. Brand new semester, and I just want you to switch gear and make up your mind now. Okay. As I was thinking about this Gospel of John this morning, when I woke up, I was reminded of my college years, studying of Roman, uh, not Romans, gospel, uh, gospel of John, and I met Christ through this Gospel. Do you know Christ? Have you met Christ? And I remember when I was a college student, second year, and just meeting Christ with, along with my friends, uh, just a wonderful memory. Life n really never was the same. Okay? So I want to kind of like nudge you and kind of like throw some, like some uh, poke you so that you'll be, you'll have a desire to put your heart in it. Can you imagine if you just mess up the beginning, the middle will be very difficult for you, let alone you may not even be able to finish it. Okay? So I'm asking you to do that. And it's interesting because I was reading uh, uh, in, 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 you know, this week, Martin Luther uh, wrote that, listen to this, check this out, this is really interesting. For some reason, if there is a disaster in this world and everything burns, uh, everything burns uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Bible, and except Romans and Gospel of John, I thought that was interesting, okay? And the Christianity will survive, he said. And he's no novice who's saying this. If everything burns, if the Romans and the Gospel of John remains, Christianity will continue. Do you see the weight? Do you see the importance of these two books? Okay? And it's, it so happened that, that those are the two books that we dealt with last year in 2018, into this year and 2019. Okay? So that's the Gospel of John. And... What is the Gospel of John about? Three questions I want to ask you. Okay, listen to this. What is it about? Why did he come? And what has that got to do with you? Okay. Maybe you do not have any answer to any of, the, any, any of the three questions. Maybe you already have a solid answers to those questions. You know what John's Gospel is about? It is about Jesus the God. God. That's going to just spin everything differently. If you look at it, it's made up of 21 chapters, and the thesis of this paper is written in first two verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I don't know what you hear, but something incredibly significant, okay? And the one thing that is really uh, like classic about John's Gospel is that he speaks the weightiest truth in the simplest terms. Do you hear it? Right? He speaks the weightiest, the heavy, heavy, heavy doctrines in the simplest terms. For example, the Word was God. Not is God, but was God. What does that mean? Right? God is love, right? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The weightiest stuff in the simplest terms. So it is about Jesus, the Word of God. Word of God is not something you find in the pages of a dead book. It's a person. It's a person, okay? So why did Jesus come? And I asked this question, and I, I thought about this question. I was talking to Tim last night. What do you mean? Why was, 
you know, why was the Gospel of John written, and why did he write this? Why did he come? You know why? If you look at me. For God so loved you. Isn't that what John 3.16 is? For God so loved you. Would you. Do you know him and do you love him? Do you care to know him? It's incredible that he loves you. He loves you, right? In chapter 20, verse 31 says, this may be written so that you may believe. Why does he want you to believe? So that you may have life. Implying that if you don't believe, you do not have life. Doesn't matter whether you went to church all your life, your great-great-grandfather went to church, where whether your father is a pastor, it doesn't really matter. Those who have the son has life, and those who do not have son does not have life. Son means life. No son of God, no life. And isn't, isn't, it, isn't it amazing that he wants you to believe? Okay. I want to ask you this question. When you say you believe, believe in someone, what does it take for you to believe in someone? I think that's a good question. It could be a very broad question, but I think it doesn't have to be. When you say, I believe in him, when you say, I believe in him, do you believe in your father? What does it take for you to believe in your father? Right? What does it take for you to believe in someone? What does it take for you to believe in someone? Let me just throw, throw a few things. Does, should that person uh, be a person who cares about you? When you say, I believe in him, he cares about me. If he doesn't, you can't really say, I believe in him, right? How about that person should be pretty consistent, consistent. You see he's in one day, he's out one day, he say this one day, he say that one day. Can you put your trust in him? Can you believe in him? No, you can't. So someone should be very consistent. And someone who's not weak, who cannot handle even handle himself, someone who could handle, someone who could help you, someone who could rescue you, someone who could deliver you. I believe in him, right? A few more. How about, should that be a person, someone who keeps his word or he changes all the time? He said yes, today, tomorrow maybe, and the day after, no. Can you put your trust in him? Can you believe in him? No, I don't think so. So it should be someone who could deliver, rescue, and save, and someone strong, and who cares about you, and who cares about your life. Can I just ask you, does Jesus qualify for you to believe? Does he qualify? Okay. And how come you don't believe then? How come you don't believe? Right? So, Third and last question, what is that got to do with me? 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, whoever does not have the Son of God, listen, does not have life, period. Okay? And whoever has the Son has life. He is the life. In him was life. Okay, I'm going to be explaining this. I don't know where, what your stand is in terms of evolution and uh, creation. We went over this like a couple years ago at New Heart. I think it's worth going over one more time. We're going to look at very first verse of John's gospel. It says, in the beginning. Can I ask you, where, when is that? Where is your beginning? Is there a beginning? This is exactly what like scientists, atheists, and theists or Christians argue about. Okay, basically this is what it is. Atheist, matter and energy existed first, somehow, eternally. No life, no plan, no intelligence, no design, no purpose, just matter and energy. How do you like that? And one day, somehow, life was evolved. Okay, that's basically the premise of atheistic scientific view. It really is. Matter and energy existed for it. Where did it come from? They don't have a solution to that. It just, it's just there. It was there billions of years ago. And somehow life evolved, and somehow through mutations and chances, and the life, biological life like yourself, complex as it is. Do you, do you even know how complex you are? 
your, what, what your body's made up, made up of. We talked about this before. You know, I was a biochem major, and when I was studying uh, biochemistry, it just, it just blew my mind. How could that happen by chance? When I was taking gross anatomy in my dental school, how could that human body come together by mutations and chances? Right? But that's what exactly what atheist view is. No plan, no intelligence, no design, no purpose, no hope, I think. So when you die, you go back to nothing. No hope, no design, no nothing, 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 nothing. That's atheistic view. Okay? Can you be hopeful? Right? And then John's Gospel says, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, obviously, is the same two words in Greek, in Septuagint, as the... Let me just go there. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, I'm not really good in Greek either. And I don't think Paul Park is good either. <laughs> uh, I only show because these two first two words and arche is exactly two same Greek words in the uh, Greek translation of Old Testament, uh, uh, Old Testament Septuagint, in the beginning. Obviously, author John is reminiscing very, very, not accidentally, but intentionally, put it, putting the place of John's gospel with Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, if you think with me, he's talking about, the author of uh, Genesis is talking about what happened after the beginning. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Do you get it? But in John's gospel, he's not talking about what happens after the beginning, but he's talking about what happened before the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Do you hear it? It's amazing if you think about it. Before time, before matter, before energy, before there is anything, there is a person. The word is not a dead page word, but it's a person. Existed, pre-existed the creation. Eternally. And that's why he's eternal. Okay? And that's the word. Okay, let me go to what I could handle. Okay. <laughs> In the beginning was the word, not is the word. So interesting. And the word was with God. What does that mean? Okay. What is the significance? He was pre-existent before the beginning, but he was with God, which means word is not God. There are two distinctive persons. Do you hear it? Is that important? Absolutely important. Absolutely important. This great doctrine of Trinity, which we cannot back off at all in Christianity, begins with this. The person of God, excuse me, person of Jesus, person of the Word, is distinct from God, and He is God and one God. Okay? Coexistent. Preexistent. Coexistent with God. Hmm. And then the third statement, and the Word was God. Self-existent. Okay, amazing if you think about it. Moses asked, if I go to uh, Egypt, and Pharaoh asked me, what is your God's name? And God told Moses, my name is Yahweh, self-existent God. I am. I am who I am. Okay? And then Jesus, the Word, was God. And if you know John's Gospel at all, seven times, very, very intentionally, he speaks like, I am Yahweh. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the gate. Do you hear it? The people knew what he was doing. That's why uh, the traditional uh, Jewish establishment tried to destroy him and kill him. Why? Because that's a blasphemy. How could one man, a son of Joseph, call himself God? But he was God. Right? He is God. Okay? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God, and he sums up in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. You know, these two verses is the thesis of an entire, uh, entire writing of, of John's gospel. He states what he wants to talk about, explains for the next 21 chapters. What is he trying to do? He's trying to tell that Jesus is God. Okay, Does that make any difference? Of course it makes a difference. Whatever you read afterward is talking about God, men, is dealing with. Remember, what's the first miracle? First miracle of turning uh, water into wine at a wedding. Okay? And that person who turned water into wine is no, no one other than the eternal God. Chapter 3, Nicodemus. Okay? What must I do? You must be born again. You must be born again. Who is he? Eternal God speaking to you. Right? Chapter 4, what is it about? The woman at the well who, was, who had five husbands. Anybody had a five husband? Would you raise your hand? Okay, I guess not. There are people like that. Okay, Five husbands. I don't know. Brother uh, chuckles. That's fine. Yeah. Five husbands. You know, this person was like the bottom of the bottoms. And nobody treated him like a human being because he was, she was a Samaritan. And she was a woman who went through five divorces, now living with someone only, only to put food on the table. You know, people do that. People have to do that all over the world. And to him, the eternal God came and went. Woman caught at the act of adultery. Remember that chapter, John chapter 8? Okay? Early in the morning, it was a setup. We know it was a setup. A woman caught in the act of adultery. How do you get caught? Right? Stupid. You should be more careful. No. But she was caught at the act of adultery and brought before Jesus in front of the Jerusalem temple. And eternal God deals with her. Hey, woman, where are the people who is condemning you? There's no one. They all left. And then eternal God says, neither do I condemn you. That's the gospel, people. John chapter 9, who was born, uh, a man who was born blind, right? From birth. Whose sin is it? Is it the parents or is it mine? Whose sin is it? Why is, is that person blind? It is neither the parent nor the, nor the child. That's eternal God. But most importantly, that eternal God who was at the beginning, who was, who was before the beginning, pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent God, hung on a tree. How crazy is that, people? How crazy is that? If you see Jesus as God, it's been everything differently, doesn't it? Could there be more important thing in life? Your marriage more important? Your career more important? Your graduation more important? Your child's success more important? What could be compared to this? That's why I really do believe if you really see Jesus, there is no second. There's no third. There's nothing, actually. Everything is just a means. And he is the end, okay? Uh, oh, I can't handle that, right? The purpose of John's gospel, believe it or not, it's clearly written in chapter 20. It's made up of 21 chapters. And the purpose of John's gospel is written very, very clearly, okay? Now, Jesus did many other signs, that's a key word, signs, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, okay? But this gospel of John is written so that you may believe. Why? Because he loves you, right? So that you may believe, so that... By believing, you may have life. Implying that if you don't believe, you do not have life. You do not have life. I went to church all my life. You do not have life if you don't have it. I've been going to, my whole family has been Christian, Christian family for five generations. You do not have life unless you have the son. Okay? But this is written. In other words, through this revelation, grace of God, you may believe. 
What does it take for you to believe? With your life, He cares about me. He loves me. And He's willing to sacrifice His entire life for me. And He's consistent. He's trustworthy. Do you know anybody like that, by the way? Do you know anybody like that? Do you have anybody like that? Right? Do you know anybody like that? who could rescue you, who could rely upon, who could trust, who is consistent, who cares about you like that. Do you know anybody like that? I don't think anybody would come to this kind of category. And the Bible is saying, so that you may believe, so that you may have life. I want to share uh, William Barclay. This sounds, it may sound very lame, but this is, one of the most profound truth you're going to encounter, okay? Let me read it to you, okay? If the Word was with God before time began, if God's Word is part of the eternal scheme of things, it means that God was always like Jesus. That's the, that's the statement. It means that God was and is always like Jesus. Let me, let me finish and then explain, okay? Sometimes we tend to think God as just and holy and stern and avenging, and, and we tend to think that something that Jesus did changed God's anger into love and altered, okay, altered God's attitude toward men. The New Testament knows nothing of that idea. The whole New Testament tells us that and this passage of John especially tells us that God has always been like Jesus. Okay? Two implications, if that's true. You could know God. You could know God. If you look at Jesus, if you look at the Word, if you look at John's Gospel, you could know God. Right? Isn't that amazing? You could know God. Second thing is, God was always like Jesus. Jesus did not change God after he came. He was always like, uh, God was always like Jesus from uh, uh, before the beginning. In other words, what you see in the Gospels, how he treats woman who was caught at the act of adultery, is how God sees you. Do you hear it? Can you imagine you get caught in the act of Adultery. By the way, you will get caught. Absolutely you will get caught. But can you imagine the shame? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Like, you may have thick face, but if you're caught in the, let's say, cheating on an exam, and you get caught, can you imagine how shameful that is? And yet, eternal God, treat the way he treated the woman who was caught at the act of adultery. That's who God is, people. We have a, this misconception that, oh, God is always like just and righteous, and he is. And he's stern, and he's, and there's no room for any error, and it's just uh, fire and destroy, consume, all of that and then there is Jesus, who is very different, showing compassion, love, and mercy, and patience. And, and, you know, it's just two different persons. No. The Bible is saying God was always like Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Aren't you glad God always was like Jesus? Okay. Revelation chapter 11 Jesus shows up, and we talk about this coming of Christ, okay? And there's a glorious chapter of the wedding of the, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, marriage of the Lamb, right? So here's what is written in Revelation chapter 19, toward the end of the book. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, Faith uh, with capital F and capital T. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his heads are 
many uh, diadems, and he has a name written that no one else but himself, he is clothed in the robe dipped in the blood. Hmm. Blood. Blood of the Lamb. And the name by which he's called is what? The Word of God. Word of God is not a dead page thing. It's a person. Eternal God, pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent, self who became a man. Why? Because he loves you and that is his name and that's a person. And my question to you is, do you believe in him? Do you believe in him? I really want to ask you, do you believe in him? What difference would it make if you believe in him? I think all the difference in the world would be, would be made. All the difference in the world. Would you be shamed all the time? Would you love to sin all the time? Would you love to just criticize all the time? I don't think so. Would you always like hate your family? Because it's just so messed up. No, right? He's the word of God. And the army of heavens, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him and white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, Ephesians chapter 6, the word of God, sharp sword of God, okay, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of irons. He will treat the winepress of fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe, on his thigh, he, he has a name written, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One of the things that really revolutionized my Christian life recently, okay, Word of God, okay, Word of God. There is a written Word of God, and then there is an incarnate Word of God, and they work together. Do you hear me? That is why when Dr. Brian Chappell came, it just revolutionized, revolutionized. When I am faithful, I'm nothing. I'm just mere dry stick. But when I am being faithful to what has been written in the, in the Bible, faithful to, faithfully explaining what the Scripture states and proclaiming, you know who's at work? Christ himself is at work. Right now he is. Right now he is. And those God grace, hear it right now. And that word, with empowered by the Holy Spirit, could transform your heart forever. That's the only thing that could transform your heart forever. From your religious life, which leads to death from a life of Christianity. I really do believe that. Is anybody with me on this? Can you say amen if you do? It's going to revolutionize. You know, I don't know whether you notice, I listened to these three testimonies three times. Same testimony. Actually, it was a shorter version. And... We spent last two days in Africa. We were going to go to uh, safari okay, and uh, see waterfall and hippopotamus and elephants and things like that. But we canceled it. And the reason I canceled it was, I know I owe them a lot, but the reason I canceled them was I wanted to have a time that would make a difference in their life. And we, so we stayed at, at the compound, and I just asked them to spend a few hours sitting down, recapping everything, and try to answer these two questions. Number one, what is the gospel? And number two, what is the gospel to me? Okay, you should do the same, actually, if you, if you have time. It was just in, incredible. On the last day, it took two sessions to hear everybody. And we were basically going around and people were explaining the gospel out of their head, mainly out of their head. <laughs> but I was chuckling because they were all saying the same thing. Okay? Marianne shared, I don't know, 10 minute version of, it was about 10 minutes, wasn't it? Longer? No, okay, 10 minute version of the gospel. And basically everybody shared that. And I just chuckled because Hannah Choi, who's the youngest in the team, shared, followed by Paul Park, who's the oldest in the team, okay? And I, I, I was just listening to Hannah share the gospel, and then Paul Park shared the gospel, and I, I was just chuckling inside because they were saying the exactly same thing. 
And as soon as Pole Park finished, I said, fancy. Okay. And exactly the same thing, but a little fancier words. But I was rejoicing. People of God, what is the gospel to you? Youth group, does gospel mean anything to you? No, seriously. Does it, does it have anything to do with your high school? Does it have anything to do with your future college and your, yeah, your career? I hope it does. I hope it does. Okay. Let me just continue. Uh, Jude chapter 1. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and great uh, joy. Listen to this. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time. Jesus was before all time. He's the word. He's eternal. Okay? He's eternal. John chapter 5, verse 20 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my, hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. Okay? He does not come into judgment. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Some of you have passed from death to life. And those of you who do not have Christ has not trans, uh, moved from death to life. Still remain in death. I was reading John chapter 3 this morning, okay? The mo most famous verse in John chapter 3, uh, chap uh, John's gospel is what? 316. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not eternally perish, but have eternal life. You know what follows after that verse 17 and 18? Those who have the son will not perish will not be condemned. But those who do not have son, standing condemned. Read, read. That's NIV. You're standing condemned. Oh, you're not neutral. You're not, you're not on the safe ground. Not according to the scripture. You're not neutral. You're not safe. You're standing condemned. Any moment, what is holding you up may open up and you will just drop. Jonathan you, Ed, Edward used to preach like that. Any moment, this bow that has been pulled will be let go. Right? You're standing condemned. And Jesus came and he wants you to believe. He wants you to live. I don't know what your plan is for the next six months. I don't know what your plan is for next uh, year. I just pray that you will, know, you will get to know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you will know God. God who loves you. God who reigns the universe. God who writes history. I think it is more important than SAT. I really do think so. I think it is more, than, more important than MCAT. I really do. I really think so. I think it is much more important than, you know, uh, try to raise, uh, you know, make your business prosper a little more. Those are means, people. Don't use the means to God. Right? Don't do that. I want to give you just a few things about John's Gospel as you have this uh, appetite rising, I hope. The few things that is special about John's Gospel is that, number one, uh, this Gospel is very different than Synoptic Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are called synoptic gospel because they are similar. John's gospel is different. It's written about 30 years afterward. I mean, different people have a different view, but I think it is written later by an apostle who survived until into second century. Now, what is that, why is that so important? It is important. L listen to this. When Jesus died and resurrected and ascended, Christianity just kind of took off from Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and to the entire Roman world. Could you picture this? Okay. And 30 years went by, and John, looking at all of these, 
and see Matthew Gospel, Mark Gospel, Luke Gospel, and later he wanted to supplement what he feels by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Christianity he feels he wanted to add. Do you see? That's, that's why it is important. John lived much longer than other, dis, uh, other disciples. The other disciples were killed early, early on. But John was in Patmos and in exile, and he had a chance to write 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelations, and the Gospel of John. So it is very different. What's different? In the Synoptic Gospels, you will find about 50 to 60 miracles. But in John's Gospel, you only find seven. Why? Those are seven signs. Signs? What does that mean? See, I, I told you that's a key word. What is a sign? When you see a sign that says, New York City, this direction, 20 miles. Is that sign significant? Yes, it is. But is that sign the reality? No, it isn't. Then what is a sign? A sign is a significant thing pointing toward the great reality. Okay? In other words, these, sign, these miracles, which you will only find in John's Gospel, turning water into wine, why is that so significant? Marriage. Marriage. Right? What, what about uh, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead in, in four days? Why is that so significant? I don't know exactly why those are not written in the other Gospels, but it is only written in John's Gospel. Jesus say, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Person, life is the person. These are signs that he's describing. Okay? The second thing that is very special about John's gospel is the seven I am statement. He's making it very clear that I am God. Okay? I am God. And the third thing special about John's gospel is about individuals. God loves the world, but God saves one person at a time. Can you say amen if you believe that? God loves the world but God saves one person at a time. If you look at the persons in John's Gospel, they're not highly educated religious people who are worthy to be saved. A woman who was caught at the act of adultery. Can you beat that? Woman who had five husbands. Now, just so shameful, so bitter. He hates all men. How about Thomas? I don't believe unless I see. I don't want to believe. Peter who denies, who was someone who was born blind from birth, all these individual stories. But Christ came to save one person at a time, people. And you could meet that God man through the study of the John's Gospel. And I pray that you will have that desire. Okay? And John's Gospel has been written later. So it is very different than the synoptic Gospels. But I think the most important difference between other Gospels and John's Gospel is the basic premise, thesis of John's Gospel is He is God. Does anybody believe Jesus is God? Did you say amen? amen? And He became a man. And He hung on a tree for you. And you're going to just scoff, right? You're just going to laugh. Please look at him. That's John's gospel, people. He was before the beginning, pre-existent, eternal, co-existent with God, self-existent God. In him was life. Only in him was life. It's not matter and energy turning to somehow into life. Does that make sense at all to you? Somehow mutated, somehow by chance, does that make sense at all to you? Because we are human beings created in the image of God, if you deeply listen to yourself, that's not going to satisfy you. There's no way that's going to satisfy you. You may be deceived that, oh, okay, that, that may sound more logical than creation, but it does, it's not going to satisfy you. On the other hand, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that God in Him was life. If you could believe by grace, it's going to satisfy you. It's going to satisfy you. 
doesn't it? Just last. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. John's writing style is very interesting. He say one statement in positively and follows by negative statement saying the exactly same thing. He's going to repeat. Uh, he's going to do that. Whoever has the son has life, positive statement. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Negative statement basically saying the same thing. It's true, though. If you have the son, you have life. If your father has the son, he has life. If your spouse has the son, he has life. Your son or daughter has the son, he has life. If he doesn't, if she doesn't, she doesn't have life. That's what the scripture states. John 10, 27 Great I am the shepherd chapter. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. My sheep. My sheep, right? And they will never perish. And this is what I want to share, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. Does that sound like Romans, or is it contradicts Romans? What do you think? It sounds like Romans, doesn't it? What can, what, whom shall separate us from the love of God? For I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We're beginning a new chapter, and I pray that God will humble you, really humble you, humble me, you know, I clean up all my desk. You come to my desk, it's cleaned up. Roman stuff is gone. Enough of Romans. <laughs> now, I got a new binder. It says Gospel of John. I pray that you will, you'll be humble enough to prepare. Right? Humble enough. If you know Jesus, you will know God. And in Him was life. Let's pray.